So now let's consider. What if you had some arbitrary power of n? Okay. Now we've been calling this um, these integrals capital I so far, and one of the reasons why that's convenient is because it lets you see. You remember for this problem? Oh, look, there's an I that appears again. So there's this relationship here, and it just makes it algebraically a bit simpler to deal with. Okay. I'm going to take advantage of that same thing um, again, but I'm going to extend the notation a little bit. Because you see how um, in green, you notice I highlighted, look, this integral is not the same every time, but these clearly are in the same, they're like kind of like a family of integrals together. Okay? So this is kind of like i where the power is 2. And this is i where the power is 1. And this is i where the power is 0. Okay? So what would you call if I had the integral of x to the n? Yes. This is i where the power is n. Okay, so I'm going to call it i subscript n because I'm going to have a few different i's flying around and I want to be able to distinguish between them and I won't actually know what these numbers are, right? So I need to label them in some way. Okay, so just like before, and maybe we can do this part in our heads because we've seen it, we've just seen it happen, right? What are we going to choose for u and db on the x? Always either yeah, you're, you're so commonly going to put your exponential here because it ends up with something just like you had before. And you want to put your polynomial term up here because it gets progressively better each time you go through integration by parts. Does that make sense? Okay. So therefore, this next line, I'm going to have u and v. u and v. So we chose u to be that polynomial term. Next, yes. We chose v... Well, we chose dv on dx, but because of our choice there, you just ended up with v being e dx again. Okay, and here comes my v du component, so the integral of... Now, I already know what v is, it's e dx. What's du going to be? X minus. Yeah, so this is, this is the result of just one application of differentiation to whatever I chose as u, right? So v du, over here I'm going to have mx to the n minus 1. That was me differentiating once. Yep. dx. How, does, how do you feel? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now have a look at this for a second. Let's just tidy it up. Just like I did before, I have a constant, which I don't need to actually have inside the integral. I'm going to pull it out. So I've got my x, n, in the x. Take away m, lots of what? Now, I am trying to find, just like I did before, what's the connection to the earlier integral that I started with? This guy, right? Now, if I just put the terms in the right order, if I write that polynomial term out the front, just like there was a polynomial term out the front here, you can see that this is part of the family. This is in that group of, of original integrals that I started with, with one difference. The power is no longer n. The power is n minus 1. Everything else is the same. I mean, well... There's only an e dx there, okay? So the pattern in this case, quite easy to identify. I'm going to write it like this. Okay? So, what is this? What you have just written down, and I'll put a green box like this. This is an interesting thing, okay? Because at one, at sort of looking at it from one way, it's like this is a bit awkward, but looking at it another way, it's very, very powerful. What we've just written down is called a recurrence relation. A recurrence relation. That's a bit of a mouthful. That's the title for today as well, if you want to write one. Okay. What you've got is a definition for something, some algebraic thing, this integral i n, right? And the way you've defined it, the way you've defined this thing is in terms of a kind of version of itself, right? So this is, in programming terms, we call this a recursive definition, right? It's like, what is I n? Well, if you tell me what I n minus 1 is, I can tell you what I n is. Now, we saw this all the way back in series of sequences, right? You can come up with recursive definitions for, say, successive terms in an AP or successive terms in a GP. For instance, maybe you want to write this off on the side in a different color. Or just you have an AP. Right? You can define the nth term in terms of the term that came behind it. Right? If it's an AP, you're going to start with the previous term and what makes me go from one term to the next is an AP. You're just going to add like the common difference every single time. Right? So the nth term is the previous one plus some kind of difference. 
right? And in the GP, we can say the same thing, but of course it's not a common difference anymore, it's a common ratio. So you'd say the previous term multiplied by whatever that ratio is. Okay. So these are kind of like this, right? You see there's, how do you get this one? Just have a look at the previous one and then you can tell me, okay? So you can take advantage of this anytime you like because it sort of automates this process of integration by parts, right? Yeah. Does this only work for when you have to do it? No, it works in lots of different contexts, okay? Now, just before we leap off to, to see different ways that this will work, let's just try this with the next one up, okay? So this was I2. Do you notice that? Powers 2, all right? If I asked you to do I3, you'd have to go through this whole process again, but would be one step up, okay? But let's see if this will not make things a little bit easier for us. Okay? So I'm going to write I3. Okay? And I'm just going to use this recurrence relation, this definition here, having gone through a single application of integration by parts. You know, when we went through here, it was the same integration by parts. Again, it's just the powers that just drop down a little bit. Okay? So let's watch what happens here. I'm going to write the first line. I'm just going to substitute in 3 everywhere I see m. Okay? So this is going to be x cubed, e to the x. Take away what? Three lots of i n minus 1, which is 3 minus 1, which is 2. Right? So you see that step there is what has dropped the power down, just like here. This is I2 equals that thing minus 2I1, see that? Which is about to appear. So I've got x cubed e to the x, take away 3 lots of. Now just like I did in this line, I'm now going to write again, well what's I2? I2 is this thing with 2's everywhere, there are m's, right? So I'm going to write that as x squared e to the x, this should be familiar, this is our line over there. Take away what? Two lots of i1. But x cubed e to the x minus 3, x squared e to the x. What's i1? i1, I've got x e to the x, so I'm going to climb one more step down. Right? Take away two lots of, this is i n, so i1 will be x to the 1 e to the x. Take away what? One lot of i0. Okay. Now, I will come back to this i0 a bit in a minute. Um, not in a minute, in maybe a lesson or two. Because when you have a look at the way you define this, depending on what your original integral is, sometimes there's no such thing as i0. Right? It's like maybe you're, you end up dividing by 0 or something like that, depending on what kind of original integral you began with. But in this case, i0 makes sense. It has a definition. It's well defined. What is i0? I actually already have it on the board. Yeah, th there's I0. We actually wrote this, right? Look, oh, there's a power of 0. And a power of 0 just means it's multiplied by 1. So therefore, at this point, I can say x cubed e to the x minus 3 minus 2 minus 1. But I0 is just going to be e to the x. This is the last integral. So I'm going to bring my constant in there. Okay? As we know, we don't, it doesn't matter where the constant is. So just have a look at that, right? Now I can, um, I, just like I did before, take out a common factor of e to the x, because it happens every time. And then just watch for your signs here. The first one I've got is an x cubed term. How many e to the x's do I have here? Minus 3x squared. How many e to the x's do I have here? 6x. Uh, I've got plus 6 times x. By the way, an easy way to know you're on the right track is because you can see my powers coming down from each successive application of integration by parts. And then I've got one last one, right? Uh, minus 3 times minus 2 is plus 6 times minus 1 plus constant. Okay? So you can see here, having done a single application of integration by parts, being that all I'm really doing is doing it over and over and over again. I've incorporated that, I've built a rule, a recurrence relation, out of my first application of integration by parts. And then once I have that rule, I can just use that rule multiple times to climb down the ladder, as it were, and get down to something which just gets evaluated, which is I naught in this case. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, now this is the, the simple examples, the simplest example that I could choose, because you can see the, the climbing down very easily because it's a polynomial. But number one, 
this recurrence relation idea, it's, it's more versatile than that. You can use it in more than just, oh, it's kind of cool that the EDX stay the same. I'm about to show you an example. And secondly, even though we've seen recurrence relations are built, well, we began looking at them through integration by parts, you can actually develop recurrence relations without integration by parts. We're going to get to that soon, okay? So this idea here of getting an integral in terms of like a smaller version of itself, that's what this is about. 